Good day, I'm Dr. Wall, and today we've got a very exciting conversation with Professor Lou Felick. Professor Felick is Emeritus Professor of Counseling at San Francisco State University and a senior scholar focusing on training, research, and professional development at the International Feuerstein Institute, formerly the International Center for the Enhancement of Learning Potential. He is author and co-author of a number of books and research papers on dynamic assessment, LPAD, the Feuerstein Instrumental Enrichment Program, and Mediated Learning Experience. He is a clinical and educational psychologist with extensive experience with the training and application of Feuerstein's Instrumental Enrichment Program and the Learning Propensity Assessment Device in child, adolescent and adult populations, focusing on both learning disabilities and academic performance and enhancement objectives. Professor Felick worked very closely with the late Professor Ruben Feuerstein, a relationship that spans more than 30 years. You are so welcome, Professor. I'm pleased to be here. So, Professor Felick, you recently published a biography on Professor Ruben Feuerstein's life named Changing Destinies, the Extraordinary Life and Time of Professor Ruben Feuerstein. I did. And uh, of course, that's a very exciting read uh, that was recently published. So from the biography, it is evident that the two of you had a very close relationship over many years. Where did it all start and uh, where did you meet Professor Feuerstein? How did it happen that you got more involved in his work on mediated learning experience and its applied systems? I met Professor Feuerstein almost by accident in 1972. Uh, I got a call from one of my doctoral mentors saying that this um, person who I didn't know was coming through San Francisco where I was living and working um, and he might need some assistance. So I called him and he said, no, I don't need any help, but if you are the friend and student of Juanita Collier's, I'd like to meet you. So I went down and to the hotel, a very simple hotel in downtown San Francisco, and uh, we spent the afternoon talking. I c I've come to believe that things that um, happen in one's life are almost meant to happen, because he was on his way to Honolulu to present the assessment program, the LPAD, to the American Psychological Association. Right. And I was on my way to Honolulu at exactly the same time to do a consulting project. And I said to him, um, when, when, when we're both in Honolulu, may I come and listen to the presentation that you're going to give on this assessment? And he said, of course. And at the time in my professional life, I was consulting with school psychologists and other mental health practitioners in the United States to um, help them uh, enhance their ability to diagnose uh, learning and behavioral difficulties from the psychological tests that they gave and other kinds of educational interventions. And when I listened to Professor Feuerstein talk about the LPAD, for me, it was the glue that holds the bricks together. It, was, it answered the questions that psychologists had been asking for, practical psychologists, not academics, who had been asking for years. How do I make meaningful the results of these tests? How do I help parents and teachers to uh, make changes in the uh, learning and behavior of the students of concern? And so at that point, I vowed that I would learn this program. And uh, parenthetically, uh, he was not as well known as he later became. In the later years, he could not go to a city and not be besieged by parents and teachers uh, and many of those trips I did go with him. But in the, that first Honolulu experience, his afternoons were free. And I was not working in the afternoon. So I would meet him and we would drive around the island and uh, talk and learn and we became friends. But it took uh, almost eight years for me to follow through on my resolve. 
So I really didn't start to learn the Feuerstein techniques until the early 1980s. Uh, and in the intervening time, I was pursuing my academic pursuits. And I was also helping to develop a school for children who had learning and behavior difficulties. And when his books in 1979 and 1980, his first uh, books were published, uh, I saw those books and I said to my colleagues in our school, we must be doing these things. Right. We must be trained and we must train our teachers and we must bring these things to the, to the children and the parents uh, that we were working with. Uh, but it was, um, and I remember writing to Professor Feuerstein in 1980 and saying, I don't know if you remember me from 1973, but uh, I'm now doing the things that you were promoting. And he wrote back immediately, he said, not remember you. I've been waiting for eight years for you to contact me. And so that became our, that became our association. And also, um, interestingly, I worked with him for close to 15 years before it was discovered that we were related. Really? That his mother and my father's father were first cousins from the same small village in uh, uh, Romania. Fascinating, uh, and uh, that was only part of the of the uh, the, the relationship. And so, for the first um, years, I learned and I taught the programs. And slowly, by about 1989, uh, we began to work more more closely together. And I feel blessed to have had the contact with this man, who was truly an extraordinary human. And uh, to be with a man who, um, while he was still alive, had joined the pantheon of great cognitive psychologists. So now, and even 15 years ago, 20 years ago, he is, was being compared with, for the quality of his thinking and the, the nature of his work to Piaget, to Vygotsky, as one of the main contributors to what we now know as cognitive psychology. And his, his life and his work truly impacted many, many lives across the world. Yes. In, in my book, I, take a, I use the phrase to be, uh, to be um, present at extraordinary times. He had the good fortune to be developing his theories and concepts at a time when the world was ready to take a new and different look at the way people learn and the way people develop. And his theories, which he promulgated, formulated in the uh, 1950s, uh, based on theoretical and conceptual formulations, have turned out to be confirmed by the research uh, of present day. We are engaged in a revolution in the brain sciences. And yet the revolution is still at the very beginning. Right. I like to say when I'm lecturing, when I'm teaching people, that in the cognitive science, in the cognitive behavioral sciences, we are approximately at the same place that um, uh, Columbus was when he set out to explore the new world. Uh, that there's so much we are, we're, we are learning, and we will continue to learn, that my prediction is that much of what we think and we know about the brain now, within five to 10 years, will be obsolete. The, it's growing so rapidly. Yeah. And I'm pleased that uh, Professor Feuerstein lived long enough to see the confirmation in the hard sciences, if you will, confirmation of his theories. Yeah. And of course, in the 1950s, these ideas were really, it went against the grain of psychology. Absolutely. He told the story that in the 1950s, he would sit with the great neurologist at the time, <clears throat> Wilder Penfield, Donald Hebb, and they would say, we, we know something must, must be happening in the brain when behavior changes as radically as 
we can change it. But we can't say it publicly because it's hypothetical. The only, at that time, the only way you could know what was going on in the brain was literally to open it up. Right. <clears throat> but with the advance of the non-invasive uh, technologies, uh, I can observe what's going on in your brain. I don't even have to use electrodes anymore. Right. Uh, to see how you're learning, where the learning is taking place, what kinds of changes take place. We can now measure changes in electrical conductivity, in, and we even can observe new neurons and synapses forming as a consequence of external learning experiences. That's right. So the ability to change the brain is just so remarkable that um, we now can say without exaggeration that our brains are our most plastic organs. They can change. But Professor Feuerstein's proximity to the epic events was critical because he was beginning to talk about cognitive modifiability and uh, from two perspectives. One, <clears throat> from the perspective of those people who were deprived of their educational or their family experiences, exposed to heavy traumas, who were very low functioning. And the sentiment at the times in 1950 was, these people are gonna be like this for the rest of their lives. Right. We'll take care of them, we'll make them comfortable, but they'll be like this. And he said no, and he saw ways. But in order to assess how the learner could be changed, a new technology was needed. So he developed the technology. And then if you, can if you know that you can change a person's functioning, you need tools to do it. And so he developed teaching tools. And he did it from a human humanistic point of view. But the other issue that I think brought this work to prominence is that in the early 1960s in America, but also in Europe, there was an awareness that educational and um, social systems were not responding adequately to the need for the needs of the disenfranchised minorities yeah. and uh, I was working as a doctoral student and a psychologist in uh, a major American inner city and we were beginning to look at poverty and its effects on learning we were beginning to look at family systems and the disruption of family systems and right around that time, Professor Feuerstein had come to America and was beginning to talk about his concepts. And he tells a story, and I have it in the book, uh, of lecturing at New York University. And there are 300 people sitting in the audience. And he's talking about the need for cognitive modifiability to help people who had learning and behavior difficulties. And he said in the middle of that lecture, Jerome Bruner, at the time, one of the most prominent cognitive psychologists yeah. stood up in the audience and yelled, Feuerstein, this is not just for special needs people. We all need it. Significant moment. That's right. And this happened throughout, uh, throughout the, uh, the development of his, uh, later, in the, later in the 19, in, in the early 1950s, 60s, uh, he got a telephone call from uh, the private secretary of Eleanor Roosevelt. Mrs. Roosevelt is interested in the work you're doing with the um, children who are uh, low functioning as a consequence of the Holocaust. Uh, she'd like to see what you're doing with these children. Would you be willing to take her to the camps in southern France and northern Morocco where these children were being uh, housed in order to get them ready to come to Israel for uh, right. And uh, so he talks about how three or four times he'd get a telephone call, Mrs. Roosevelt's gonna be in Paris next week. Are you free to come to Paris and ride with her to Southern France? And we have some photographs of, of him showing Eleanor Roosevelt, the children and the adolescents that he was working with. He was just in the right place at the right time. Right, which is an indication that that his work and his theory created a lot of hope. Hope was a key issue. 
hope was a key issue. Yeah. Uh, you have to have hope. Yeah. It's the underneath the hope is an optimism. But the optimism is based on a credo. And later on in his life, we establish that credo. First of all, you have to have a need. You have to need to help people change. And if you have a need, you'll be willing to um, fight for, for it. And you'll be able to convince others to go with you in the solution of these things. And then ultimately, you'll be able to change social institutions. But it has to start with a need. It has to start with a need. It reminds me of a, of a video, I never knew him personally, but it reminds me of a video recording where he addressed the audience and his words were believe to achieve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's not only believe to achieve, the belief needs to be driven by a need, a need to change uh, the conditions of human beings. But you have to work to create tools. You have to, and uh, <clears throat> one of the things that um, is another meaningful anecdote in uh, the life of Ruben Feuerstein is that the Instrumental Enrichment Program, which is a program to teach through a, series, a very extensive series of activities uh, how to develop thinking skills, how to develop learning development skills. Well, he was beginning to talk about it wasn't fully finished at the time, but he was willing to talk about it in the mid-1960s. And someone came to him from a major publisher, and this is like 1967, 68, and they said, um, we would like to buy this program, and we will give you $3 million for it. $3 million in 1968. Yeah. And he said, no. The reason he said no was, he was advised by some of his people around him. Yeah. I wasn't with him then. He said, he was told, if you give this to a major publisher, they will take it, they will print it, they will put it on the bookshelves, they will sell it, people will buy it. And then his, thing, his point of view was, and it won't work. Because if you're going to develop new tools, new approaches, you have to be well trained, you have to be well supported. And so he didn't want to give up the control of the process of using these materials. And he held that to the rest of his life. Uh, a year later, he felt very proud to have signed a contract with another American publisher for $100,000. But he had control over who got the material and how they were trained. And much of our later work had to do with developing the curriculum for training for people so that they would be able to take the tools and to use them in, a, in, a, in, a, in, an, in an effective way. So Professor Fellick, two terms that are foundational to Ruben Feuerstein's work is structural cognitive modifiability and mediated learning experience. And I believe some of our listeners might not be familiar with those two terms. Would you be willing just very briefly to explain sure. what it entails? Of course. Well, structural cognitive modifiability are the terms he used to explain his theory of human potential. And he believed, and later we were able to demonstrate, that every human being has the potential to be changed with regard to the way they think and learn, and that that change is structural. Structural means that it has been internalized, it's been taken in. You learn something, and you are changed by the, by the learning, and your subsequent responses are influenced by what you have learned. So structural means the nature of the, the, what has been taken in. Cognitive means thinking about it. There are four levels of, of, of learning. There's sens sensation. You, you're, 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 see, you're hearing, you're seeing, uh, uh, you're touching, is sensory. Then there's perception. Sensation and perception. Perception is organizing it, is uh, saying these things go together. This thing looks like that thing and those things may go together. Cognition is the third level. And that's, if these two things go together, if these two things, then um, they're part of something bigger. Red. This is red, and this is green, and this is yellow, and this is blue. 
Okay, they're colors. And then colors then become part of a larger conceptual organization, a category of things. Right. And then the fourth level is metacognition, thinking about your thinking. And so structural cognitive modifiability is, is, is a way of saying that, that all individuals, regardless of their prior experience, regardless of their genetics, um, long before, long before this was demonstrated in research, Reuven was quoted as saying, and it got great play in the French press, that the chromosomes do not have the last word. That's nicely coined. Yeah. And um, it's true. Yeah. Uh, so he began working first with Down syndrome individuals. Uh, and he used to say, um, if I took a low functioning individual and I brought them up to levels of cognitive uh, proficiency, they, um, people would say, well, they weren't really, they weren't really um, disabled. But with Down syndrome, there is an extra chromosome. Can you recall a successful story of... Oh, heavens, yes. <laughs> How many hours do we have here? Um, well, his, it turns out that, that he had a niece with Down syndrome. And um, she is now in her 40s. And she is married. And she married a young man who had developmental disab disabilities of his own. And um, she works as an uh, assistant teacher in a kindergarten. And she plays the piano. And uh, it has always been considered that uh, individuals with Down syndrome can, are not musical. Uh, and there are some reasons with formation of the inner ear and so on and so forth. Uh, we have uh, Down syndrome in individuals who um, are artists and who've been, uh, you know, perhaps my favorite story is the uh, young man, young Down syndrome man, who was being trained as a caregiver for the elderly. And he came to the house of the elderly person that he spent every afternoon with, and he rang the doorbell. And no answer. And he looks in the window, and he sees that the, on the floor, the, young, the elderly person's on the floor. Yeah. And so he calls the emergency, and the emergency comes. And he becomes a hero because he saved this man's life. And in his interview in the media, he said, a lot of people think that because I have Down syndrome, I'm too slow. He says, but you know, I've learned that, you, that being slow, slow to respond, slow to walk, slow to, is really good for elderly people because it helps them to, it helps them to, uh, to, to be comfortable in their lives. That's a beautiful story. And that illustrates the heart of what his work is yes, all about. Yes. And one of the projects in the Forstein Institute, and a book was just published about it. Unfortunately, it, it was published in Hebrew, and it hasn't been translated to English yet. But one of Reuven Forstein's important concerns was helping developmentally disabled young people to have to get married, to have to to be part of a marital diet, and to get support. So now we have a community in Jerusalem of developmentally disabled young people who are married, and they get social work support. And um, and in um, and, I, and and in the in in Judaism, after a wedding, there are. There are a series of seven dinners that are given after the wedding, uh, because at the wedding ceremony there are seven blessings that are said, right. the Sheva Brocha. And so there's a, a Sheva Brocha dinner for each family. And I went to one, and the developmentally disabled couple is sitting there, and their friends, who are also developmentally disabled, are toasting them. We know these, these, this couple is going to love each other because they know how to talk to each other, they know how to solve problems with each other. I listened to the blessings of the developmentally disabled friends of this developmentally disabled married couple. 
And there were tears in my eyes. I even tear up now when I think about it. The, and Reuven had this idea that to, to be fully functional, you needed to have a kind of intimate companionship and know how to live your life as a partner with somebody. Radical idea. Very radical idea. And it's particularly relevant because a big concern now is what happens to the developmentally disabled children who become young adults. How do they take care of themselves? Who takes care of them? And structural cognitive modifiability means that not only do you change behavior, you know about it, you, you think about it, you plan for it. It's cognitive. And so one of the things that we do in our teaching of instrumental enrichment or in our consultation with uh, uh, parents and teachers <clears throat> is how to make the daily things that happen to a person cognitive, how to think about them, how to understand them, how to project them. Mediated learning experience is the vehicle to make that happen. Uh, very um, intuitively. Professor Forstein identified parameters, areas of interaction. So the mediated learning experience is the interaction that occurs yep. to make the cognitive processes develop in response to tasks, in response to activities. So it's really a tripartite arrangement. We have demands of the world that we must conform to and master we have to have skills for that how do we learn these skills we learn these skills because we develop cognitive functions we identify them what are the cognitive functions that need to be need to be paid attention to right and then we interact with those cognitive functions balancing the cognitive the learners capacities and the learners abilities and the demands of the task through mediation What's important is that facilitating a mediated learning experience, those skills can be taught to parents and teachers and practitioners, and that can make a big difference in the interaction. And I want to go back to the word you used, hope. Hope is a kind of internal optimism. When, when parents have children with developmental disabilities, they often give up hope. Unfortunately, our professionals contribute to that. Uh, one of the things that we're very concerned about is this, in the area of autism is the too early diagnosis of autism. Right. And if you diagnose a child, and, and in America, pediatricians, unfortunately, are being encouraged to diagnose autistic behavior in, uh, in two-year-olds. And then to a parent who is concerned that my child isn't uh, making eye contact with me, that my child isn't bonding with me, uh, that my child is not talking or is... Um, you, you, you diagnose them as autistic, the parents say, okay, now I know what's wrong. <clears throat> and they go to the many resources that are available for autism, and they create, in some ways, a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the professor gave a lecture, and we made it into a book chapter. Uh, and it's appeared in several places called Early, uh, Early, Di Early Detection, Blessing or Curse. Uh, and I mentioned it in the, in the context of hope yeah. uh, and optimism. When we show how a child can be changed, when we show the, in, in sometimes very uh, severe uh, behavioral dysfunctions. The parents think we've done a miracle. And we say to them, okay, it's a miracle, but it didn't happen miraculously. It happened through hard work, systematic work, but it happened. Yeah. And so parents develop expectations that uh, go beyond the manifest level of functioning. So hope is very, very important. There's a wonderful, wonderful story of a, <clears throat> a little girl by the name of Ravital, <clears throat> who 
had a condition called ornocephaly. Her face looked like a bird. Her nose was very long, her chin was receding, and at the age of seven or eight, the only thing she could do would go, <laughs> and she came to Reuben, and uh, she asked Reuben to, to help her. And this is before we had some of the technology in the, in the younger child interventions. And he tried to assess her, and he couldn't assess her, and he um, said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And so the mother said, well, could you help me to mediate her? Mm -hmm. And Ruben said, sure. And so for a year or two, every other week, mother would come, describe Ravita's behavior, and Ruben would give her ideas. After about a, two years, mother comes and says, Ravita can read. And Reuben said, how can she read? Let me show you. She comes in with a uh, <clears throat> magnetic board with uh, letters. Yeah. And she says, Ravital, write the sentence, um, I want to go to the store to buy candy. And Ravital, with her limited motor skills, and she had to look really close to the, and she moves the, and within about five minutes, she, writes, she creates this sentence. Fascinating. Yeah. And so then Reuben went, and he began to, he began to uh, have our clinical staff work with her. Yeah. Halfway through the process of the clinical staff working with her, the clinical staff said, we think Ravital, should, we'd like to work with Ravital without her mother in the room. We think her mother is giving her too, maybe cueing her to, to performance. And that's been a, a fairly universal criticism right. of um, assisted learning techniques. And so mother left the room. About a month later, Reuben gets a letter typed by Ravital. Wow. Dear Professor Feuerstein, dear esteemed Professor Feuerstein, if your mother was the only person who believed in you, if your mother was the only one who was willing to help you and fight for you, would you send her away? Please tell your teachers to allow my mother to be in the room when I'm learning. It's important to me. I know you've helped children all over the world, dear Professor Ford. And Reuben said that whenever he read the words, dear esteemed professor, it was like a knife in his heart. <laughs> These are, these are the kinds of things that have happened all over the world. And with all levels of age and population, tremendous diversity. Across the world, in many nations. In many nations. We, uh, the, 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 the Feuerstein technology, the Feuerstein methodology, uh, activities carefully designed based on uh, uh, specific articulated theory, translated into more than 20 languages, operating on all continents of the world, but not widely adopted. And toward the end of Reuben's life, that was a concern. Uh, so we know so much, and we can do so much to help people that the practitioners out in the world, the teachers, the pediatricians, the uh, various therapists, need to know about this. How can we help them know this better? So let's talk about it. In your book, you, you talk about that frustration that you picked up in the last couple of years of his life, you mm -hmm. know, reflecting on his life and what he has achieved, but still wanting to do so much in comparison with, with the need. Uh, I think you write in your book that at a certain stage, he said, if God can just give us so many more years to complete the work, what, what do you believe, what, what, what do you think did he mean by that? You know, what must still be done? Well, those were, by the way, the last words he said to me. Really? Yes. I pray to God he gives us two more years to finish our work. Two more years. He knew he was fading. Um, he... Um, had this urge to make known 
in the world. But he also had the con this concern that it's not just telling people what it is. It's not just putting the materials into their hands. It's training them. Right. So um, it was his, um, his life force. Uh, throughout his life, if people said to him, no, you can't do that, that's not going to work, he would redouble his efforts and he would make it work. And toward the end of his life, he was aware that his power was fading and that uh, there was so much more to do. And uh, he was hoping that those who came after him would, would do it. And that's what I and a number of people in the world who I am privileged to be able to work with, this is what we're trying to do. And it goes beyond the instrumental enrichment, and it goes beyond the uh, LPAD. Uh, one of our colleagues, uh, both in the Institute and outside the Institute, has, devel has developed a, a program on tactile and fascinating thing. And this is part of the cognitive modifiability issue. When the tactile program was developed, it was simply developed, its, its initial um, uh, impetus was for the blind and partially sighted to uh, develop conceptual information through a tactile modality, kinesthetic tactile modality. And lo and behold, we discovered that the seeing individual, if you cover their, they can't see, if you put a blindfold on them, and they experience things tactily, it enhances their conceptual development. Uh, a serendipitous finding. Uh, and other people in the world are, are developing programs, are developing interventions uh, to um, enhance and elaborate the implications of cognitive modifiability and mediated learning. So that was his hope at the end of his life, that things would, would, would go on. You um, work very closely with him for many, many years, shared Mary, many intimate and special moments mm -hmm. um, as an academic, as a religious man, as a, you know, on a personal level, family man. What are those characteristics that stood out for you that made him such a special person? He was probably the most charismatic person that I or you could ever meet. But as a charismatic person with tremendous power of personality, he directed it outward. He directed his power outward. Not about himself. Not about himself. Seldom about himself. He was a human being, so he had, you know, he had times when he was, he was treated like in such a way that there were times when he acted like a prima donna. And I remember one time I confronted him when he was acting particularly uh, obstreperous. And uh, he was short, and I put my hands on his shoulders, and I said, Reuven, you're acting like a prima donna. He looked at me and says, well, I am a prima donna. <laughs> and I said, in this place, at this time, cut it out. You're making people unhappy. You're, you know, this is not the kind of place that you you did not the kind of person you want to be, and he goes on. And, and he took it from you. He took it from us. Which yeah. illustrates the kind of special relationship. Yeah. Everyone who, uh, everyone who came to us and watched us work together considered like he was a father. And I accepted that. So I want to read um, a section in your book that illustrates this reciprocal relationship, the special relationship between the two of you beautifully. So you were telling in that section of the book how you would oftentimes get a call uh, after work, after hours, um, invite him inviting you to come over to his place. He would, we would finish our work day. Now he's in his 80s. We would finish our work day and at four o'clock he would shuffle out or he was in, the, in his later years in the wheelchair and he was gray with fatigue. He'd go home at four o'clock. And I knew what was going to happen, so I went home and took a nap. 
because around 6.30 or 7 o'clock, he would call me. Lou, do you feel like working tonight? <laughs> <laughs> and I would come over and we would, we would talk, we would work uh, for an hour or two or three. And uh, that happened almost every night uh, of our, our working life in Israel. So I want to read Please. that section <laughs> in the book. It's, it's beautiful. So um, I'm quoting, I was reading a section that had been created in one of these ways. I cannot recall exactly how. He was following the text. We had been at it for close to an hour with no interruptions. And you said a remarkable event in its own right. Telephone constantly ringing. He would, by the way, he would stop anything he was doing, even if it was a prominent person who had made an appointment to, uh, if a child came in and needed something. His first obligation, his first love was for, was for the children that he, people he was working with. That's special. Yeah. yeah. So late at night, no telephone, it's quiet. I'm continuing reading. So he held up his hand which was my signal to stop reading, he leaned back in his chair and closed his eyes and I awaited his reaction, which could be any one of a variation of what I could describe above. It might also mean he was too tired to concentrate and we would stop working for the evening. After a few moments, he opened his eyes and said to me, Lou, a remarkable thing is happening. When I listen to you read this, I'm hearing my voice. This is wonderful. He smiled and closed his eyes again. He was comforted and I was confirmed and we worked on in a sense of existential convergence. That's beautifully said. Would you like to just open up the curtain a little bit more of what this relationship meant to you on a personal and a professional level? He wanted me to write this book. Uh, for the last for ten years, he would say to me, "This is an important story to, that has to be in the book," or "I want you to come and meet that person." So I became a kind of emanuensis for him, uh, a kind of. Uh, I tell that story at the beginning of the book because I want the reader to feel that when I'm talking about things having to do with him. They are really very close to his own characterization of what he was experiencing. And um, so it became an almost symbiotic relationship. And the remarkable thing is that the people around me, my significant others, my wife, whom he loved dearly, my sons, my friends, my sister and brother, they all knew this relationship, and never once in 30 years was I chided for, oh, you're paying more attention to Reuben and that life than, than our life. It was all uh, of a piece. It was all very uh, synchronous. And so it was hard to, uh, after his wife died, uh, much of our evening talking was just sharing life experiences. As he became uh, infirm, we would occasionally take him in his wheelchair uh, to various places in the country because he loved nature. And uh, we just shared a whole lot of experiences. Uh, he loved his family. And uh, we would go to the Dead Sea, to the hotels in the Dead Sea, so that he could experience the hot water of the Dead Sea. and. Uh, more than once, we would plan a three or four day period at the Dead Sea, and after the second day, he would say, I need to go home. Why do you need to go home? I need to go home because I can be with my family anytime, but there are people out there who need me. Oh. Committed uh, to the goals. And um, it, it, it fit my, my sense of my life. Uh, there were a lot of people who couldn't get along with him. He was very demanding. Um, the word is often used, exploited. And um, at the very beginning of my association with him, 
I went to him and I said, um, you don't know me as very well yet, but you need to know that I'm a very committed person. But I'm also a person who won't be exploited. He looked at me, exploited? And I said, well, you know, the reputation in the world is that you, uh, you know, you take advantage of people. I know you do it in order to help the children and families that you, but uh, I am willing to commit myself to this work. But if I feel exploited, if I feel exploited in any way, I will tell you that. And I'm willing to walk away. And within a year or two, I, he, he did something which bothered me and made me feel uh, like I could be exploited. And I wrote to him and I said, Reuven, remember the conversation we had a, a year or two ago? Uh, this thing you're imposing on me feels exploitive and I, I can't do it, I won't do it, and I will reluctantly stop my work with you. And he wrote back immediately and he apologized. Wow. And he said, uh, he said, uh, I will never do that to you again. And uh, I understand you. And for the next 25 years, we never had a dispute. We never had an argument. We never had a sense of, you know, I never felt being taken advantage of. Now, in retrospect, some of the people who look at this life and say, well, you really gave your life to him. It doesn't feel that way. In a committed relationship, of mutual respect. Of deep mutual respect. Not so much in the book, um, but um, in some other piece you gave me, he always he also had a, a strong vision for the developing world. Yes. Which is important because mm -hmm. two-thirds of the world's population lives in developing countries. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to elaborate a bit on that? Absolutely. And I, the, the, the way I can bring that alive is that um, I initiated a number of things in India and he was never fully satisfied with what we did in India. You're not getting it to the people who need it. You're not getting it to the children and the families in the villages. You're not getting it to the poor people. You're getting it to the people who can afford it. And he had this sense of bringing this potential to <clears throat> the, those populations that were suffering from famine or from violence or from chaos. And remember, he started this because of his response to the Holocaust. Yeah. And I, don't, I think that paradigm never left him. Yeah. That um, it, was, it was the children and the youth of the Holocaust that motivated him to believe and act to restore to life. You know, his phrase was to bring people so that they can reflect the image of God. And so when he looked at Africa, and when he looked at um, uh, places in the Far East that were experiencing chaos, were experiencing the genocides that occurred, he, he said the, the answer to this is cognitive. The answer to this is helping people to learn. And frankly, in my one of the things that, that I that, that brings me and motivates me for to work in South Africa is the, are the experiences I've had. And I've shared some of them with you personally, of working with uh, people from the townships and people in the small villages in the, in the mountains, hills, and watching, participating with with them in in bringing them to a, po a point of, and then when you have cognitive abilities, then you can solve problems, and you can plan, and you can um, organize. The ultimate of cognitive development is to extend oneself in time and space. You're no longer limited by your immediate experience. You now can project yourself out in time and space. To extend oneself in time and space. I've never heard it like that before. That's beautifully put. So I know you involved in different projects all over the world. What else is Professor Lou Felic busy with? I know you write a lot currently. Well, um, you've been a motivation for it. <laughs> your projects and your, your interests have been a motivation for it. Thank you. Um, In the 1990s, uh, 
when I was teaching at a university in the area of, of counselor education and training therapists and counselors, I began to take the principles of mediated learning experience and build a curriculum for uh, how to become a good clinical interviewer, how to, uh, how to help people therapeutically. Um, and um, interestingly, uh, Reuven was the, was the initial impetus for this when I first met him, uh, because he began to speculate. He said, you know, we've done a lot in the cognitive area, but we haven't done that much in the affective area. In the, right. the, uh, the, 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 and there's a beautiful piece, I don't know if I ever shared it with you, where we differentiate the cognitive factors from the affective, from the, uh, from the emotional factors, and, and then bring them together. Because uh, Reuven took a uh, metaphor from Piaget. Piaget said that, uh, that, uh, that there are two sides of a coin. You know that metaphor. Yeah. Uh, there's an affective side and a, an intellective side. Right. Uh, and you deal with both. And then Reuven modified that metaphor to say that, yes, but the coin is transparent. And the mediation occurs on the edge of the coin. Right. Bringing it together. That's, so, a, that's a very strong metaphor. So I began to think about that and think about some of the um, implications of bringing mediated learning experience into the conceptualizing and disseminating of counseling skills, of interviewing and counseling skills. So I'm currently writing uh, about that and I'm just about finished with a manuscript uh, that might create a, that will create a, a new curriculum for the training of counselors and psychotherapists. Uh, and I used it with, with my students 25 years ago and now I'm bringing it to the, to the modern, modern day. That's very so exciting. That's, that's where I primarily right now. And I'll continue to help people and I'm invited to uh, train in the assessment techniques and in the attention uh, techniques. And uh, I have the pleasure of being able to do this in India and in uh, South America and around the United States and here in South Africa. For which we are really grateful. If there's one message that you would like to send into the world, one take a home message, what would that be? Be optimistic about the potential to overcome limitations. Be willing to act on that optimism. Well, if I might take the liberty to thank you, not only for this conversation, but that you remain committed to the cause of changing the lives of human beings and that you remain faithful and committed and really giving it your all to continue with the legacy of Professor Ruben Feuerstein. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And let me end this by saying that whatever we have to give cannot be given alone. We need partners. Thank you.